top. Everybody for coming in. Marilyn has given me a few notes of things to remind us of the day. So let's start with that. Um, this, uh, this guy, if you could take it, your version of this thing, and turn it to airplane mode. And we'll just treat this as one nicely proportioned airplane for the day. Um, uh, and keep it off during the day if you can. And I don't have... Everybody got your version of this? The largest booklet in there on the undergraduate school this year. You're going to want to keep it as I have over here. And throughout the day, just scribble notes into it. Keep track of what the tutors are saying and what the plans are for the year. If you don't have a prospectus, you can grab them up at the front desk. We've got a stack of them up there just opposite uh, Philippa. Um, the year-long unit briefs should be online on the website. If not, that's a part of the equation today you'll want to take into account. So after listening to the introductions, go online later today, have a look at those year-long briefs. The tutors have worked really hard over the last few weeks to put together uh, a pretty thorough account and plan for the year, and it'll help you think about what everybody's trying to do and, and what they're talking about in these presentations. The other thing we're going to do today at 1.30 in this room, so, th so today is organized into a morning and afternoon session. At the lunch break, during the lunch break at 1.30, for any of you who are interested, come back in here. And before we kick off the afternoon unit intros, we'll do a question and answer session again. We've invited in a few students who've been through the process before. I know a lot of you are new to the AA unit system as of this morning, so you might have questions. The best people for those kind of questions are always students that have been through the process, and they'll be happy to help you out again. So that, again, that's 1.30 in here for maybe 15, 20 minutes. There'll be a short break after then, and then right at 2 o'clock, we'll kick off with the afternoon session. Um, registration for all returning students. Could I see this piece of paper? Everybody got a copy of this sheet? Marilyn has got some extras over here. Everybody needs one copy of this. All returning students, if you haven't done it yet, you must register before you're able to fill this form in and turn it in tomorrow morning to select units to interview with. We are doing reg registration for all returning students all day long, upstairs, off of the terrace, in the rear presentation room. Okay? Uh, new students who registered in Introduction Week uh, also need a copy of this form, just in case you're, you're unaware of that. So for those of you that arrived last week, you've already done the registration part, but you still need from Marilyn a copy of this form, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, what you're going to be doing today is listening to all 13 of the units present their year-long plans. We've asked each of the tutors to do the impossible, which is over about a 25-minute presentation, present a summary of what they're going to do over the next 32 weeks, working with all of you in each of these units. It's a tough brief they have to try and explain that. Um, having sat through yesterday's fantastic uh, di diploma intros, all I can say is embrace the entire day and not think it's about you figuring out which of the half hours is most worthwhile for you the entire day will be worth your while. And the reason for that is these things aren't, aren't opportunities for unit masters to advertise units or to sell their worlds to you, however much it might seem like that at the beginning. These are really interesting statements about where architecture is today, seen from the perspective of our unit masters throughout the day. Enjoy the entire day's presentations on that front. What you're going to do at the end of that process is something really hard which is try and think of the two or three units that you'd like to have an interview with tomorrow to think about as a home for the rest of this year. Not a straightforward thing to do. We're going to give you the overnight to think about that. As I said earlier, go home, have a look at the year-long unit briefs. At the end of this day's session, like we did yesterday, you all are going to be invited into this room. Am I right that we're here? Into this room with all of the unit masters for a chance for you guys to talk to the different unit masters. And my advice is very simple. Go up and introduce yourself. Tell them what you're interested in. Have a question or two about the presentations. Grill them if you want. Give them a hard time. 
show some interest in what they're doing, um, but more than anything, just ask the questions that help you think about whether they might be the right setting or not for you for the coming year. Um, as you fill out this form, and it's a very simple one, choice one, two, or three, first choice, second th choice, third choice, might be tough for some of you to sort of balance out which of the others, wh which one is the one you want to see most. We organize this system so that all of you get a chance to have an interview with your first choice. That's all we can guarantee in this big numbers, numbers operation, but, um, but, but we promise you that. So the first choice is obviously an important one for you. Um, what we do at the, it, uh, after you all hand these forms in tomorrow morning uh, is that uh, um, Belinda and Marilyn and everyone upstairs dump all of your forms on a table. We randomly sort them into the different unit first choices, assign a time for you to go in with your portfolio tomorrow and have a conversation with the unit masters. Um, and you'll be able to get that information tomorrow at about 12 o'clock after all of that sorting is done. The unit master is ready to start their interviews. One small point uh, for those of you trying to think of a way to game the system. Um, first choices are the ones that are guaranteed. There is no such thing as two equal first choices. That's just indecision. And you've got to embrace decision making. So I know it's going to be tough for some of you, but please Think it through carefully. Um, a lot of you are going to be surprised because you're going to find your second or third choice people might be a better home after you've had a conversation with them. Roughly speaking, for those of you that don't know, something like two-thirds of you will end up in units that you selected as a first choice. That means a third of you won't and will go on to some other unit. That's not a big deal and it's a very regular feature of the school. And as I just said, you're going to be surprised sometimes by the things that pop up in the unexpected conversations uh, or selections that are made throughout the process. Um, remember to bring in a portfolio tomorrow. You're going to need that. It happens every year. People show up and say, sorry, I forgot my portfolio. Not a good way to start the conversation with your unit masters. The other thing you're going to do this evening, after you've had a good long think about where you might want to study throughout the year, is you're going to open up that portfolio before tomorrow morning and have a look at it. Not to practice. This, is, this isn't a kind of rehearsal process where you can find a way to talk elegantly for five minutes about the work you've done. But just to remind yourself that in a five-minute summary of the things you've done last year or even in previous years, you can pull out those two or three or four things that you think more than anything say something about what you're interested in, why the sort of unit that you're having a conversation with tomorrow might be a good place for you to continue to learn and develop your agendas, obsessions, whatever else they might be in architecture. Have the total confidence on your side of the table tomorrow that you can do that in a few minutes' time. You're dealing with a group of teachers that have got a huge amount of experience and ability to read portfolios. They want to have a conversation with you. My other advice to you all is always simply walk into it as person to person in the interviews tomorrow. We're trying to find people in the right settings with other people. It's not about trying to convince people with a drawing or two in terms of making a decision. So just have the confidence and the interest to ask questions with your unit masters and to talk about your own interest. That's what they're looking for too in the process. Uh, what else for this? Um, how are we doing the setup? I see, I've, I've filled my time. Good. Um, so as I said, uh, overnight, you're going to fill in the forms. Once Marilyn has countersigned them today, saying that you've registered so that we know we've got you and can look after you tomorrow, um, get those forms here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Hand them upstairs in Studio 2. It takes us a couple of hours to work through all of the, the uh, selections to get everybody sorted and give you all interview times. At about noon tomorrow, upstairs, lists will be on the wall showing your name and the time for the units that you get a chance to interview with tomorrow. Following the interviews you have with the unit masters tomorrow, come over to Santa in the undergraduate office and confirm with her a decision once it's made. I say the same thing to you as I say to the unit masters every year, that as the interviews are going on, just make decisions. If it feels right in the moment, it's right. Again, embrace that and your ability to make a quick decision. Don't let indecision run too long through the day. As you confirm that selection, downstairs with Santa so that we can confirm it with you. Um, and we will be getting on with the year. Um,
What else for now? I think those are the main things. This year in intermediate school, we've got 13 units. As I said, we've organized the day into a morning session, lunch break, afternoon session. <clears throat> Enjoy the day. No repeats, Marilyn. I did have one or two questions by people. It's a rare question you get in the intermediate school. People asking, can I go back to the unit I was in last year? In the intermediate school, no. No, you want to embrace different units. You want different experiences. We occasionally see that happen at the diploma level, although the student and unit master need to make that case jointly to the school to reassure everyone that, in fact, it's not just a safety blanket decision, but it's an opportunity to continue to push and develop a project that might have started in fourth year into a fifth year thesis. You all are at a different stage where you're trying to sample and learn from different unit masters and different agendas throughout the year. So yes, an important point that Marilyn reminds us on. Um, I think we're ready to go. That's the main thing. Everybody enjoy the year. It's going to be fantastic. Intermediate's got a great lineup this year. As I said, Skip the temptation to see the magic half hour in the day that you think is the one that makes total sense and embrace the surprise that's going to come up as you see some of the different, different agendas and projects throughout the day. So enjoy it. Everybody, thanks for coming in. Summer is now over. Welcome back to, to the AA, or welcome to the AA if you are new to the school. Um, as you know from your paper, we are into three. Um, into three is Ricardo de Ostos and myself, Nanette Jakowski. Um, this is our year eight of into three uh, under our direction. And um, I guess we will start. Environmental complexity and social participation are our main research concerns when we explore infrastructures and social conditions. Technological pre or post digital possibilities are growing rapidly, getting ever more complex and multiplying our ways to interact with each other and with the urban and natural surroundings exponentially. However, our understanding of the environment around us does not match the same speed. While we seem to long for organic food, recy recycle our waste, despise uh, blood diamonds, buy fair trade coffee, treat our hearts online, upload our intimacy on corporate iClouds and strive for different interactions and experiences, we, 21st uh, century global citizen, can hardly grasp the environments we create, alter, and reshape simply by being. In this scenario, technological action and social reaction are not that straightforward uh, and transparent. They are ambiguous. This techno-social courage is a contemporary condition. While individuals might ignore or do not suspect the complexity and implications of piling up landfills on the outskirts of of their towns, growing e-waste uh, landscapes in distant worlds, exhausted uh, abandoned mines, underground sweat factories, non-recyclable nuclear sites, and so on. How does the public participate? That's uh, what we are uh, discussing in the unit. Beyond the basic concept of social and the public that is giving shelter, Architecture can and should also speculate about possibilities of how spaces and cities will adapt to the techno-social conditions. <coughs> Tales of wondrous unnatural opportunities, unexpected man-machine symbiosis, prototyped visions and cautionary stories about unforeseen catastrophic scenarios, we in Inter3 will explore many ways to create architectural spaces and enrich ambiguous situations. So what you're seeing is a planet city is a, can you guys hear me at the back? Yeah. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a planet city from a fiction that we all know from the late seventies, uh, but this was the nineties version of it. Um, and what is interesting about the discussion of infrastructure, uh, 
uh, an architecture of infrastructure and environment is exactly the idea to what extent this plays along with our own interest. To what extent this is connected to the crossroad of our generation. How differently or how different is the crossroad from the generations of the 60s, of the 19th century, of the generation of the 80s? You know, what makes this architectural output or architectural interest and or pool ideas sometimes very similar come together differently and I think the the discussion here today of this crossroad that we place at the unit for all these years has constantly been of how you can start connecting the notion of what, what makes us as a group a collective while keeping the individual part while still being having a name and a preference above some collective uh, pressure. And it's a similar pressure, very similar to this one that we're going to investigate this year, uh, of land ownership. So the idea of land, right, which is also understood as part of the topography, the geological crust on the top of the, of the planet Earth, but it's also how we live, it's also how we divide portions of what we live and how we can build. Uh, so understanding the notion of land, of land ownership, can be left to developers. It can be left to maximizing footprints. It can be left to not understanding the role of history, understanding the role of environment with tomorrow's uh, perspectives. Uh, I think differently for that, rather than ignoring that version or antagonizing that version, we are very interested to search for new problems. What are the new problems which are current, which not even globalized world, but more of a planetary city? So what are the problems? There appears they are regulating, legislating when a, when a diamond mine appear inside a city. Or no, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe a city appears around a diamond mine. So I think the complexities of what can regulate, of what can start suddenly being a horizon of possibilities for architects also become the horizon of possibilities for the city. Because in a way, like uh, Lebels Woods once said, an architect, uh, architects are the stewards of, of space. So we look after it, if you like it or not. Uh, and the idea of land is to sometimes, how people look at land today, how people look at the idea of cities and infrastructure development. Uh, so we want to, create a point or a space this year where we can confront all these discussions. We can confront the idea that ownership, participation, interaction might be, have a deeper relation to the idea of politics and infrastructure and an environment. And to that extent, we're not necessarily going to be dealing with that just through rule books, because that's not what we do. But we're going to be looking at other possibilities of understanding how we interact with each other. Sometimes we're going to be looking at games, sometimes we're going to be looking at uh, structures or coding structures like Minecraft or Little Planet, Little Big Planet, in order to sort of understand how, well, some people which are very similar to architects are doing some pretty interesting ideas in the, on, on the notion of sharing. Uh, so more specifically, and dropping a few kind of academic hints in the old school. We're going to be looking at this sort of a trilogy of evil, of the first part of the year, which are some guys who published books on the 20th century. The last one is the 21st century, uh, which is the idea that maybe these stories that we're discussing, and by stories I call elements of these great narratives that we share in different countries, they might have a lot of things in common. And those things in common, the types of common things might be associated with the idea of land. Uh, so in the role of land, we're going to be looking at a few archetypes that differently for connecting to utopia or dystopia, they might connect to other aspects of how architecture can be speculative. In other words, it can debate things which are about to come. It can be commentary, it can throw comments or seeds of projects which might be kind of disrupting the real. Uh, but also they can be, uh, in a sense, productive. They are kind of real propositions to be implemented. So we're going to be looking, uh, starting of every reality starts, which is in fiction. You can just look at politics, then know that fiction and reality are 
sometimes it's scarily close. Uh, we're going to be looking at endless buildings. We're going to be looking at uh, the history of ideas in this kind of sharing understanding of land. The understanding that sometimes alternative way of living comes with alternative regulations or alternative ways to enable people to create an infrastructure of living. So when we say land, doesn't mean that we're going to kind of become geologists or we're going to become, it's actually the understanding of how architecture, right, and the parcel of land or the understanding of this kind of common, commonality, they interact. So through these archetypes that we've been passing, we're going to study in order to complement, in order to create, to give a space for us to think further, to, because in, at intermediate it's very important, once you do research, you have the necessary space to do that, which is something that we try to do in our practice as well, just down the road in front of the British Museum. Yeah, so our practice, and uh, Ricardo and mine, is uh, called Nyan Eostos. Um, and we uh, also research uh, and are pretty much interested in similar um, aspects uh, that we have now already introduced. So this particular project you are seeing here is uh, called the Ple Pregnant Island, which was a study on a uh, huge uh, dam, um, hydroelectric dam in the Brazilian Amazon, where there was a drastic and quite uh, quick change of environment, uh, because due to the dam building, um, before a small, well not that small, but a river uh, was then turned into a huge reservoir. So um, what used to be um, hilltops um, are now islands in the lake that you saw, can you see there in the image. Um, that, this is an image of uh, our project in response to this uh, situation which was uh, simply uh, one dwelling for the uh, local residents that had to be misplaced due to the uh, flooding of, of the land. And um, what we did, we uh, studied in detail, of course, the traditional way of living, but we um, inverted it and uh, made it in a vertical way so they can still live with the, with the flooding and the changed uh, environment. Another uh, project, um, from us is the Hanging Cemetery of Baghdad, um, which uh, looked at the situation back in 2004 in, in Iraq, where I think at that time when we started with the project was 25,000 civilian deaths. And uh, we don't know the city, we don't know Baghdad or, or Iraq as such. We only knew it through the media, through TV broadcasts and, and newspapers. So we were thinking, how do we perceive the city? Um, and how, how do we see w what is going on there? So we pretty much um, elevated uh, a cemetery that is growing over the city of Baghdad uh, and casting shadow on, onto it. So as you can see, we use uh, architecture, we use um, narrative as well to um, discuss uh, a certain problem or condition that we, that we researched before. We also um, do a lot of um, installations that we build in the office. Um, that is, of course, a uh, smaller scale than the projects shown before, but they discuss um, a same scale issue, if you so want. This is the ectoplasmatic library in Paris, which uh, looked at how, how we store information at the moment, uh, or nowadays, <clears throat> with so many digital uh, data. And uh, the installation was uh, recording the use of space via those two creatures, uh, medusas, we called them and uh, it had a reaction in the space and changing the space as well. That's uh, yesterday's futures installation uh, at the British Embassy here in London and the ectoplasmatic housing installation in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah. 
So as Annette is saying, through these projects like this one in the World Cup in Brazil, the idea was rather to isolate people in this particular project was to create a sense where the protesters and the people which are going to the stadium are interacting. And usually enough, sometimes they are the same person. Uh, so that is at the stadium and the son is actually protesting um, or the same family. So, I mean, the idea of creating narrative projects, of the idea of looking at fiction, uh, is the idea that to a certain extent is useless and to another extent is extremely powerful. It's useless because sometimes you read a book and it doesn't help you to get a better job, but it makes you understand yourself better, understand your position in relation to the world better. So narrative has that organizational power of organizing and relating to other stories. Once, every time that we show these projects, we show them in a different way, simply because we're constantly learning and we're saying we mention something else about the project. Um, so these studies, again, of relation to infrastructure uh, of, and how environments are related, we're gonna start looking at different scales throughout the year. We're gonna be working again with the idea of how a very articulate element of experiments on the first term is going to help you to create your final project. So what is this unnatural quality of these projects? How do we start kind of creating an architecture that relates to an environment, however, it's not naturalistic in its nature, in, in its kind of core, in its, its DNA? Uh, so enough introductions. I think you want to know what you're going to be doing more specifically. If you saw the extended brief, we're going to be looking at the term one, means October, November, slash December. Uh, Genesis, destruction, rebirth, in search of a new land definition. Uh, then we're going to be looking at the production of a document which include a film and also a printed document of the first term. Uh, and the second term, we're going to be looking at the unit trip. And we explain bit by bit. So on the first project, the Genesis Destruction Rebirth, we're going to be looking at these kind of canons of land, of how we can start organizing inspirations into reference. So suddenly, instead to go to Google and collect 500 images of stuff I like, stuff that I half like, you actually start making a hierarchy in relation to certain thematics. We're going to be using Ballard as a good reference for this year's development. He's a science fiction writer in Britain, but also you can say that he's a re realist writer of the 20th century, depicting the future with a magical and very brutal realistic uh, imagination. So the first type of land that we're going to be looking in October is the, this is the promised land, right? The, the people, we or some people are entitled to a land, not just religious, but actually once you're doing a project and you're willing to do a project which you stabilize, uh, which creates a certain stability, which is almost infinite, right? People are happy ever after. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the idea of cursed land, which is so much part of our mythia uh, in the contemporary society, mean, looking at dystopia, looking at cataclysm, look at the archetype of destruction. In every story, you have the idea that there is a genesis, there is re a destruction, and then comes something else. Uh, Wonderland is not rebirth. Wonderland is the idea of what happens when this imagination, which is not under check necessarily with the logic of mathematics, or mathematics at the high school at least, uh, is start connecting with imaginative aspects of our mind. But we can present the same three concepts related to architecture. So in October, we're going to be looking at Paolo Soleri and his idea of the promised land through the Arcosanti projects in New Mexico or Arizona. Uh, so suddenly, the promised land will become the idea of the project as the social environmental stabilizer. The idea of stabilizing the environment with a project for a, a, a certain number of people. Instead of cursed land, which has a more religious connotation, you guys might come up with different descriptions of the negative type of project. The idea of the inverted negative project. That through doing something completely opposite to the promised land, you might suddenly create an interesting discussion, highlight points which are interesting for us to move forward. Or the idea of the wonderland or the layer city. 
idea of multiple plays at the same space in time and a fluid time. So you have that massive overlap. Once you look at something, you cannot fully understand, but you carry those memories with you. So on the first term, we're going to be looking at doing drawings. We're going to be looking at making models. We're going to be looking at imaginative ways to create space. Maybe we don't call it architecture yet, but we call it place, we call it atmospheric place, uh, spaces, and we start kind of giving qualities, constructing uh, your portfolio through understanding these three archetypes. Models are sometimes ways like drawings, they accumulate little stories of you. They also sometimes they become obsessions, and these obsessions suddenly become a part of the way that you work. When we say we like atmospheric, that is not just renderings in computer, but it's also your models, the idea of light. Uh, and we're going to be looking at science as something else, not just the scientific separate from the fiction, but what makes science and fiction an interesting place for discussing environments and architecture. Uh, so that's a lot of how we work. We're going to be working through uh, sometimes in the month of October, a lot of insertions into uh, understanding these archetypes. So we're going to draw digital painting, sketches, collages, uh, but constantly starting to skill yourself. Uh, in November, we're going to test some of these ideas, not only through prototypes, but we're going to be testing that through performative models. Uh, these models are part of small architectural productions that you're going to do. And like a director, you're going to be shooting a film about this. So you're going to curate those models, producing a film to then uh, understand, that, understand that production, understand your relationship to time, understand when something changes, uh, they sp not just the space inside, but the space around changes with it. So for example, this student last year in November learn how to sue, learn how to uh, discuss a, uh, sue a plastic material that is used for inflatables. And that research continued and evolved into an installation, which was also further accompanied to a final project. So again, the interest in the unit of hacking, of do-it-yourself, of start looking at alternative technologies, on the first term is going to be kind of anchored around those, those two possibilities of drawing the hell out of these things in large drawings, which are large drawings mean that you grow in detail, you grow in resolution, you accumulate knowledge, not just information. And also you is start building the idea of how your interest evolves from the brief. So you just don't do what we ask you to do, which is a preparation for the unit trip that happens in January. Yeah, so after the term one, uh, we will travel to Sri Lanka. Uh, in order to search for a specific land condition. Um, as you may know or may not, uh, Sri Lanka is one of the richest ecosystems of the world, but also a country with a complex and bloody history of land ownership. So uh, I think the 30 years long uh, civil war uh, finished in 2009 and following that there's a lot um, of, um, yeah, as I just said, question of land ownership, who owns the land. And uh, these are common uh, pictures you see throughout the country, uh, land that is reserved for the uh, Sri Lankan uh, army, uh, also land that is occupied still by land mines or land that is, uh, and you can see it here again, uh, land that is um, used temporarily for uh, all the internally displaced persons that had to leave their homes uh, during the civil war. We will look at Sri Lankan uh, topographical and geographical maps, of course, which will then lead us to the climate as well. Um, it's quite interesting to look at this map because you uh, can see quite clearly uh, Sri Lanka has two zones. It's a wet zone and a dry zone, and there's nothing in between. It, it's quite clearly um, bordered. And yeah, that leads to floodings uh, on the other side, droughts. And we will look at how that uh, changes or how, how the traditions like the traditional stilt fishing has to adapt to these uh, changing conditions. 
there's uh, one uh, railway tunnel, I uh, put that image there on the top, um, in Sri Lanka, which is quite interesting because on either end you can actually experience two very different climates because the, tun the tunnel starts on, on one side on the dry zone and ends on the, on the wet zone. We will look at um, Sri Lankan uh, production uh, or traditional way of producing uh, things like tea production, rubber production, um, gem mining, salt production, and always, of course, in relation to land, how land is altered or how land is used. There's another interesting fact uh, between uh, well, Sri Lanka leaks, uh, is located in the Indian uh, Ocean, and there's uh, something called Adams Bridge that uh, might have led or connected Sri Lanka to India, which is this very thin uh, connection that you see on the uh, satellite image. And we will look at uh, conditions like that because uh, there's a myth about it as well, how that um, was constructed or how, how it was used in ancient times. Uh, we will look at the ancient city of uh, Sigiriya, which is uh, just a massive rock that seems to have uh, come out of the earth. Uh, Dambula Cave Temple. And of course, we will look at urban scenarios as well, um, taking the largest city in Sri Lanka as a, as a research ground, which is called Colombo. Um, so, as Annette is saying, we're going to probably show a few works from the unit in order to end the presentation in the next five, six minutes, uh, so we don't create a, a big delay on the day. But I think the idea here, as you've seen, is that the, the projects and the research will evolve, and the, the, the Sri Lanka trip is normally uh, our unit trips, our previous students know, is a slightly sort of uh, buzz round, including madness, or late nights, uh, but it seems that we always bring the same number of students and the same number of people fill those numbers, which is all these years quite positive. That was a joke. Uh, so we're going to be looking at this idea of time-related places. Uh, the idea that the projects like these ones for Harry Clare, I graduated last year from the school, is our understanding the necessity to create a new cartography to accumulate new pieces of land. So these stalactites, they are kind of growing, they are made out of waste and they are also connected to the idea of land. Or Eleonore, again, looking at the Amazon and creating a space or a place which is placed in the middle of the river and is controlling, is relating peoples with that infrastructure of water. Like this project, for example, in London, where we never go to the river because it's cold and it doesn't have a deep tradition of going to the river like in Varanasi in India. So this project was articulating that idea of ownership in relation to the, to the threshold of London uh, and the Thames River. Uh, so we're constantly going to be looking at uh, how the project evolves between experiment, between design, uh, between the idea that sometimes you're going to do a project and you understand later. Sometimes you have a, an idea, a good idea of what to do, and a better idea of what you did comes after through organizing the portfolio, through journey drawings, kind of creating that back and forth between the production and the thinking. Uh, on the technical study side, we are very keen to encourage students to, uh, as we always joke, not just do the kind of the I-beam type of TS, the technical study, but to start doing something which is slightly more provocative, which might take into a new territory of new technologies, incorporating old type, old ways of doing things. Uh, so again, as you have seen, we work hard with the students in order to is start presenting, giving skills, uh, digital skills, analog skills throughout the first term. And around uh, February, March, we introduce another level of skills because after all this time, we're going to be then learning how to model better, uh, also how to render best. You're going to have the, the, your software of choice in order to 
not just produce images, but actually see how you can think architecture differently. So constantly between the idea of the making, the idea of the drawing, the idea of analyzing the context and how you evolve the context into an architectural proposal that has a story, articulate people, and sometimes it's just a wall. Like this project started in King's Cross in London, it was just a wall that produced herbs. And around that herb production, a series of other elements start appearing. You start having a journey from north to south, and suddenly the gas holder became uh, the earth pro uh, herb processing infrastructure. This was a second year project. This was a third year project, again, dealing with the idea of infrastructure and that notion of food. So on this one, what happens to London once we start producing the food that we actually eat and not just kind of import? So constantly I've, the project becomes uh, the vehicle for you to understand larger questions. Uh, the, the notion of how you can bring people together and to imagine the idea of land, the idea of ownership, the idea of doing what people do, potentially incorporating new problems. Yep, um, to just uh, have a sum up again what Inter3 is about. Um, we are, um, and we cannot um, you know, highlight that enough, we are a strong design-based unit. So we, we do like, as we explained, reading, uh, researching, making, but we do everything, we do research, we think through the drawing or, or the making uh, models. So we are from day one on designing uh, and drawing. We are very open to uh, uh, individual talents and skills uh, and also multiple ways of presenting uh, the project. However, what unifies the uh, unit is exactly those three or four points that you also can uh, read in the extended brief. This, uh, as we said, we read a lot. This, uh, a few of our uh, readings, so our, our books that are also available in the uh, bookshelf in, in the library. Uh, so, just to finalize the presentation, this was a project last year. This was the River Bronze Medal nominated from the school last year, uh, from Maya again. Again, the idea that you might think, where does an image like this come from? Is it Photoshop? Actually, it comes from a deep urban understanding of how people have been displaced in Cambodia, the place we visited last year. An understanding they start kind of altering the axis of the city, connecting the political uh, power source of the city to the river, which is a land which is actually being, being claimed, and created a series of uh, minor lake moments in an area. There was a lake and now is a desert. So constantly understanding, sometimes doing projects which are provocative, like SJ on his second year, creating this floating uh, Zeppelin elephant-like, or creating a paper factory, which is a spreading paper when poets finish their work after uh, the first kind of annual production of poetry. Or sometimes understanding that to do a project, you actually make a model first, and then you go back to the drawing, like Natasha did last year. Uh, or Patricia understanding the idea of the forest, the limit of the forest to create a threshold around that area in a series of vertical points. So again, here the idea of fiction is constantly connected to the idea of the infrastructure and environment. So the unit has the concern and to work together with the students and professionals to start articulating the production with, the, with your own interest. And that is what narrative is about, is about the, how you can tell similar stories or stories which are existing in a completely different way because you are telling them. So the idea of architecture and storytelling here is less about uh, a stylist. We don't necessarily have a style on the unit. I think a lot of the drawings are render based as you can see, but this is just a practice that people can choose what to do. But there are discussions. Each one of these drawings, you can talk half an hour about them and sometimes explain the whole project. Uh, so just to finalize, uh, the unit is really interested on the students that want to investigate architecture via design, but also can bring to the discussion a bigger idea that makes the design more relevant. And in this year is the idea of land. 
land ownership and how to study land is to intrinsically touch the nerve of architecture, the nerve of infrastructure, and one of the biggest questions of today, how we can deal with environment without necessarily doing environmental architecture. Thanks very much.